Welcome to Bitcoin Fixes This, where we explore the impact that Bitcoin will have in all aspects of society. Today's guest is Carl Johan Alm, otherwise known as Cali. He's a Bitcoin developer working at Digital Garage in Japan. We talk about his journey to Japan, his interest in development, and his contributions to Bitcoin Core. Kelly also tells us about the core development process and how it differs from the traditional one and how it's decentralized. Kelly is just a really good person. He's one of my favorite people to go and meet uh, whenever we go to conferences and so on. He's been a core developer for a while now and his contributions are many. I found his description of how the development process works and how it selects for certain traits like humility to be very encouraging. I hope this episode helps you understand just how decentralized core development actually is. Kelly, how's everything going these days? Going really good. How are you, man? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. You're out in Japan, which I think has had like fairly interesting response to COVID. So yeah. how's it been over there? We're going through... So Japan is, is an interesting case, I think, because I think because of the, the end of the war, the government actually has very little control over what they can do in terms of like controlling the public. So for example, the government cannot do a lockdown here, for example. Mm -hmm. It's by law, it's forbidden to prevent people from going outside. So instead, what they do is they do this thing called an emergency state thing. <laughs> and, and basically, people are just expected to stay home if, if they can. Mm -hmm. And I guess people are just like kind of expected to do that. Like, so in contrast to seeing what you see in the US where people are fighting and arguing and cops are, you know, putting people in cuffs for not wearing mm -hmm. a mask. Like here, it's like, if you're not wearing a mask, that's okay. Mm -hmm but at least cover your mouth when you're coughing, you know, <laughs> it's, like, it's like a common etiquette thing and it doesn't become a big deal, I think. So, but yeah, we've been going through these, like this, this was supposed to be like a couple of weeks, right? Back in 2000. Mm. Uh, everybody, I mean, uh, <laughs> and then we went into another one and then we went into another one. Like, I think we're in the fifth of these emergency states now. And mm -hmm. every time we go into one, the people are, are less, they take it less seriously. Uh, so every time, you know, these happen, they like the response is weaker and weaker every time. So it's only a matter of time before people stop even caring. About, you know. <laughs> Can you travel in and out like easily or is, is it like still pretty hard to get in or out based on like your status, I guess? Into Japan, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I haven't been keeping up, but at one point they were like, if you don't live in Japan, you're not, we're not gonna let you inside. <laughs> before that, it was like, if you're not Japanese, we're not gonna let you inside. But that was problematic because people who are not Japanese, you know, obviously live here. So, yeah. but for example, there's a conference in, in that I was invited to go to, but I, I chose not to because of the fact that I don't know if Japan's going to have some kind of weird restriction by the time I get back and like, hey, yeah, we're not going to let you in. Mm. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you are, uh, you know, if from a, you know, if you're, yeah, I don't know. Honestly, it's, it's kind of up in the air right now, I think. I think they're going to, like, mm. they're talking about the vaccination p passports and stuff, which, you know, mm. sounds insane. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know exactly how, but I don't think that they're restricting people to that sense right now. And also the Olympics are coming up and the the players are arriving in Japan. So that's all in the news. I don't know if, if you heard anything about the Olympics, but they decided not to hand out the 150,000 condoms. <laughs> yeah. well i heard they're not even gonna have like an audience or anything yeah it's no. just gonna be like you know in empty stadiums or i guess japanese people can be in the stadiums or something, right but. it was so, so they call them the tokyo olympics but in reality they have different events the different parts of it are handled in different prefectures mm. and all of these prefectures had different responses and different ideas on how they were going to do it some said we're going to have audience but we're going to limit the number of people and some said we're not going to have an audience but oh. that gradually you know moved towards not having an audience so i think that most or all of them are now like no audience just you know just the participants and, and staff <sighs> That's so sucky. Like, imagine if you like bought tickets to yeah. go like cheer on your country in, the, right. in Tokyo, yeah. and now you can't even go. I know, so right? Crazy. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, so enough about like where you live and stuff. Although you know, like I do bring up Japan because you're Swedish by 
ethnicity and yeah. somehow you're now working in Japan. Can you tell us a little bit more about that story and how you ended up there? Okay, yeah, sure. It's a bit of a convoluted and weird story, but it started <laughs> with me being dumped by my girlfriend. And I was I was young and she was kind of my everything and I was very devastated. And a friend of mine just said, hey, look at this movie. And he, mm. to cheer me up, he sent me a movie. It's called Princess Mononoke. It's mm. uh, one of the animated Studio Ghibli movies. Mm. I just fell in love with the language when I watched it. And I mm. was like, I just really want to learn this language. Mm. And I started learning Japanese and I started learning about Japan. And one of my big like things in life has always been AI and robotics. Mm. And Japan has this unique situation where the population is shrinking. Not a lot of babies are being born and not a lot of young people exist. But the old people are so healthy that they never die. <laughs> so you end up with this situation where, where less and less people are able to work, but there are people are available to pay for work. So, which is an ideal opportunity for robotics to be introduced, where robots can do the tasks that there are no hands available to do. So that was an interesting part that just came with it. And I ended up taking a double degree program through a university, through my university in Sweden, at a university here in Japan, in, mm. with a focus on AI. Mm. So I did an AI a master's in Japan, and I decided to work here and I kind of looked at jobs and it was kind of icky because, the, you know, I mean, you hear a lot about the work ethics in Japan are kind of like you work until you fall off your stick and then you, <laughs> you know. So I was kind of scared and concerned about that part. But then my a friend of mine found a Digital Garage, the company I'm working at now, through his company where he was working at Blockstream. Mm -hmm. And so he introduced me to Digital Garage, and I was like, wow, this is, seems like home. So I started working there. There are some parts that I'm skipping over, like the fact that I was married <laughs> once and, <laughs> and now married again and have, have, have two daughters. And, but yeah, oh. that's, that's the gist of it, yeah. Okay. So were you a developer before, I guess, getting your master's in AI and stuff like that? Or like, how'd you get into, I guess being a developer or coding in particular before all of this happened? So I've been programming since I was eight and I was surrounded by programmers. Like everyone in my family is a programmer, basically. Mm -hmm. My dad worked at the university and he was doing programming. And, and so I was kind of grew up with it. It was kind of like, you know, you know, your neighbors play with, you know, uh, action figures and, and in my family were playing with computers. So we had like an old Spectre, I have three Spectre videos. You probably don't even know what that is. <laughs> I don't know what that is. What is it? <laughs> it's an ancient computer that had like basic in it and stuff. And it had this tape thing where you could, you could load software onto it by running mm -hmm. a tape and it would send out ones and zeros and it would often crash. So you'd have to <laughs> rewind the tape and try again. If you touch the computer, yeah, it would yeah. crash. And, <laughs> yeah, but, but, so, but tape, tape, you, you actually had to, this was like a cassette tape that you're talking about. Yeah, like that yeah. You used to, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And actually like the magnetic one. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so, and I kind of worked, it, this kind of ties in with the story about me coming to Japan because the one who introduced me to Digital Garage, he was also uh, the owner of a, a game company. Mm. And I was playing that game online. It was like a, a mud, uh, kind of fancy mud kind of game where you're like role-playing mm. and stuff. And I was playing that game and I was like, I'm fascinated by how this works. So I volunteered to become a coder for the game. So I was coding stuff inside of the uh, game and, and wrote all these systems. Mm. And one day when I was looking for a job, the guy who owns it, uh, his name is Christopher Allen, uh, but I, you, you probably heard, know about him. He approached me and said he wanted me to do something inside of this game. And I said, I, I don't have time. I need to find a job. And then he's like, do mm -hmm. you know how to do PHP? And I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, I'll, I'll give you a job. <laughs> he gave me a job. And I worked for him for maybe, I don't know, it was uh, five years, I think. Maybe even mm -hmm. more. I, I took a break in between to go to university and stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah, I was working for him on various stuff. What year was that? Because he's been around a long time and he's yeah. uh, obviously involved in the blockchain common stuff that he's doing uh, in Bitcoin and so on. But what year was that? The time I started working for him was in 2005, five, six, around mm. that time. We wrote something called Synchro Edit, which is almost mm. identical to Google Docs, but it did not support Internet Explorer. 
I know that Google actually demoed it once and then they mm -hmm. moved on and made their own version of it. <laughs> but yeah, so it was a while ago. And he's been like telling me about Bitcoin occasionally mm -hmm. and I've been ignoring him <laughs> until lately. <laughs> yeah, started working for Digital Garage and I realized what Bitcoin was. So. Mm -hmm. so he told you while you were working for him or after? It was both, I think. He mentioned it, I think, while I was working for him. But I think it was kind of mostly after I kind of got finished with university and I was looking into finding jobs and stuff. Then I mm -hmm. communicated with him again and he was like telling me about Bitcoin. I should learn about Bitcoin. And I was like, okay, why? <laughs> I was a very, like there's before Bitcoin me and after Bitcoin me. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like two people. And the before Bitcoin <laughs> me was a person who like didn't care about money at all. Like I didn't, mm -hmm. like money was the most boring thing in the world like i thought it was just you know it was a means that i could use to just do what i wanted to do which was mm. you know developing and working on stuff and making things mm. so when he was talking about bitcoin i was like well sure that's <laughs> probably fun but yeah it took a while mm. well so how did that before bitcoin you sort of change into now you're a core developer, you're, you know, you created Signet, you're now like a bit editor and stuff like that. Like, like that seems like a very stark contrast. Can you yeah. tell us what happened there? Like, how did that happen? Well, so oh, Digital Garage has like a research innovation lab called, mm -hmm. called DG Lab. Mm -hmm. And DG Lab has like six branches in it. And one of them is AI and one of them is, is blockchains mm -hmm. and, you know, dev security and stuff. And I was hired and they told me I would go into the AI team and the blockchain team. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. since my background was AI, I was like, okay, I mean, I, sure. And then I mm -hmm. did not go into the AI team at all. I went to the blockchain <laughs> team. And I was talking to various people and I was, you know, they were like, yeah, learn about Bitcoin. I started looking into Bitcoin because it was my job and not because I was interested mm -hmm. in it. And... There was this point where I went from this is my job to this is my obsession in a way, uh, you know, like where you just <laughs> kind of fall over the, the cliff in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And it was very sudden and I don't actually myself, I can't really clearly define where that people where that happened. But, but I just realized that there are so many things wrong <laughs> with existing currency right now. Things mm -hmm. that I haven't thought about and I, and I realized, wow, this is really, really messed up. And, and I realized that a lot of the things are could be solved with something like Bitcoin or with mm. Bitcoin rather. And, mm. and I also realized in the process, you know, when you start out, you're like, oh, Bitcoin, but, but there's also these other things, uh, all of mm -hmm. these coins. Wow. It's, this is a big, like, it's a big, you know, universe of things. And then you quickly kind of like, you narrow it down, right? You're like, well, why mm. when you have Bitcoin and why when you have Bitcoin? You know, it's like you go from, briefly being very enthusiastic about all these blockchain solutions to, to realize, well, it's bit, you know, Bitcoin is honestly like the, the only interesting thing in this space. It's sad mm -hmm. in a way, because you, you know, it would be more exciting if other, if you had all these various things you could do. But the conclusion I, I keep drawing is that you do it with Bitcoin mm -hmm. and because Bitcoin is Bitcoin. So, it makes sense because it's on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense if it's not on Bitcoin. Mm. So all this, you know, I, I've been rambling here for a bit. And this is kind of how my, my brain went when I went through all these stages about Bitcoin. Like I went, but, but yes, and but no. And like, you could use a blockchain to like make a database and then, and then realize like, well, you can use a database to make a database, right? <laughs> so all of these like things, you know, I went through all these steps like realizing that yeah you can make a blockchain in an afternoon mm. like blockchain tech is not hard what's mm. hard is the part surrounding it it's the decentralization and, and all these things and the only bitcoin has that mm. uh, you know but there's also like pre-bitcoin me was like developing software programming computers mm. that's where i'm at right and post Bitcoin me is like, oh well, yeah, there's there's the programming and, and there's the development aspect and there's the financial aspect and then there's the social aspect and then there's all of these aspects that also tie into this system. Mm. Mm. And so you start becoming involved in financial things. Like I didn't know what shorting and longing and, and bull and you know bear and, and all these. I didn't know those expressions at all before I pre Bitcoin me had no idea what those meant. 
And post Bitcoin me does, and I also like I also realize how inflation work, you know affects things. And pre Bitcoin me vaguely realized that inflation was a thing, and that you kind of have to get more money over time, mm-hmm. otherwise you you're screwed. But I didn't realize the impact of how inflation actually trickles into the society, like who actually benefits the most from it, and like all of these aspects that tie into Bitcoin and make Bitcoin what it is. They are not just so they're not just software related or computer science related but they're related in a plethora of like different aspects of society Mm. which i didn't care about and didn't know about until Mm. you know post bitcoin me Mm. sounds like bitcoin sort of like expanded your horizons or or the set of things that you cared about expanded as a result of bitcoin yeah i mean it affected me on a personal level in ways that still kind of surprised me today. Like, you know, the way I look at whether I should eat a, a, you know, a Big Mac or not affects me in the different ways now than it did before. Like now I'm like, well, you know, there's the long term and then there's the short term, you know, like what are my end goals? And all these things go through my head, like when I'm making a purchase or, you know, when I'm buying Bitcoin, like I always think about like, not just, now or a week from now i think about 10 years from now or when my daughter's an adult or you know all these things i have changed how i make decisions and bitcoin has changed me in 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 a lot of ways that i could not have predicted i think Hmm. has it changed you as a developer because i i'm sure you had certain habits that i don't know like has it changed it let me ask it that way as a developer yeah i mean when I started doing Bitcoin stuff, I kind of just jumped into it while I was learning about it. Well, the first thing I did when I started learning about Bitcoin was I rewrote Bitcoin from scratch in C++. And I changed things the way I, I thought would be make sense. And the result was a really crappy version of Bitcoin. <laughs> but it gave me a kind of a sense of why Bitcoin Core works the way it does. And, and back when I started, Bitcoin Core looked a lot less... Uh, clean than it does now there was a lot of things to deal with and i was like well okay let's take on the janitorial role and, and see if we can clean this up a little and well i kind of kind of jumped into it to try to kind of just get a feel for it and the whole pull review process and all these things and i was kind of new to the open source development process in general i've been working on open source stuff but not in a you know not at that scope like we'd be concordant having you know hundreds of developers and you know maintainers and everything and jumping into it, I just remember distinctly that everyone was so nice. And Vladimir taught me like all these things mm-hmm. just casually as I was doing stuff. He was just, well, you know, you know, like you can do this thing like this way or like, yeah, generally you want to avoid this kind of thing. And, and just looking at reviewing other people's work, you know, you kind of get a feel for like how you can do a really structured and really like thought out proposal to change mm-hmm. the code, which is mm-hmm. what the pull request is. Mm-hmm. And with Bitcoin Core, like when you have a pull request merge, you're like, wow, yeah. Um, <laughs> that took a while. I know that feeling. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's really awesome because you know that so many people have like been trying to find issues with it because it's like, it's such a thorough and uh, I don't know, you know, so many people are putting, you know, putting so much effort into m- making sure that it's, it's doing what it should do. And, it's a really rigorous process and it kind of makes you like proud of being a part of it because mm. you know, you, you, I don't think you see that a lot. I mean, mm. in other products, just not to that extent anyway. Yeah. There's like a really high bar that you kind of have yeah. to have to meet, but I mean, you, you kind of hinted at this, but like through this review process, through this, you know, having your own pull requests, you know, examined and of course examining other people's, you seem to have become essentially a much better C++ developer yes. than you would otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, it's the energy of the people in the, like, you know, on the IRC channels and everything. These people are like, and, you know, like Peter Willey and all these people. Mm-hmm. They are like, even today, they're like hungry for, for learning about new things. And this kind of spirit kind of you know, encourages you to become better at what you're doing. And in the opposite end, if you're slacking off, you really feel it because the people around you are moving forward and improving the code base and themselves 
And if you're like, start relaxing and slacking, you, you realize, whoa, I need to pick up pace because <laughs> I'm starting to not understand what's going on in this code base. So um, mm. it's a, like from the outside, Bitcoin Core looks like, I don't know, someone said like boomer tech or something. It's like mm. not, it's standing still and everything. But in reality, it's like if you get into the details, you realize it's it's moving at a frantic pace. And I don't know, it's it's just the energy that, that inspires me. And, you know, this rigorous process forces you to rethink. And I mean, I've had pull requests if you said no. I would say maybe half of my proposals have been rejected it's for some reason. Sometimes it's been mm. like obvious reasons. Sometimes it's been, you know, I mean, no, I really think we should have this. And then discussions and people and you know and ultimately it's been shut down and, and this kind of thing is like if you think about it from a purely like you know bystander perspective you only see the stuff that goes in you don't see the stuff that doesn't mm. go in so as a developer for me like i've changed a lot because i've been rejected a lot and <laughs> i've had to rethink stuff a lot and also like things that have gone in have been going through iterations and someone will come in and say you know give really detailed and, and thorough like you know, descriptions or, or another interesting thing to me is how something you proposed that was merged, like my, mm -hmm. uh, the address reuse, avoid reuse code that I wrote mm -hmm. has been iterating after my version was merged and it's been iterating. And if you look at it now, it doesn't look at all like what I wrote and you can look at it and you can kind of realize that like, yeah, I could have done that. I could have done this and that, <laughs> you know, you can see how you could have done a better job initially by seeing how people fix your stuff. So that's also an aspect that's helped me improve. But I think like the number one reason how you can improve is like by reading other people's, reviewing other people's code in, in mm. pull request. So that's helped me tremendously. Like I learned so much by reading other people's things. So yeah, like as a developer, I've, I've improved tremendously. I can't even, I can't even, you know, put a finger on how much, but, but I'm definitely, <laughs> you know, mm. Yeah, there's sort of like gentle harshness to the whole thing, right? Like yeah. there's a, you're having to take feedback and it's kind of public and, you know, you feel a little bit of humiliation, but it sort of drives you to become much better. And right. it seems to be sort of like this culture of, I want to say open source, but I almost feel like Bitcoin is its own like, like level of rigor. I've, contributed to other open source projects and it yeah. just it's not at this level it's no, just no. so like rigorous and like so many people review it so yeah like is that a part of what you think is, is happening there is that like you guys are helping each other get better essentially right yeah i think so i think that when i started out everyone was super nice and helpful mm -hmm. and gradually especially after i met someone they would become less gentle <laughs> <laughs> and more straightforward and, and like say no <laughs> you know before mm -hmm. they would be say like no maybe not mm -hmm. and after meeting them and, and getting to know them and kind of like being friends with them i would mm -hmm. say when you get into this friendship phase they kind of cut off the polite part and then they just no <laughs> <laughs> and I see, it's kind of a surprising thing because you're like i, I feel like I, I know this person now so we're on better terms but from their perspective, they like, I feel like I can trust this person to take this the right way. So I don't have to sugar fluff my you know, words. So like you say gentle kindness, I say, yeah, yes. Well, no, well, it's, gentle it's, harshness, <laughs> harshness. <laughs> yeah, sorry, gentle harshness. I mean, it can be ungentle too, like uh -huh. if they believe you can take it. But yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I, I agree. I think that people are helping each other learn and helping each other develop just naturally mm -hmm. by being who they are. Mm -hmm. I think... Part of it is that you have to be a certain kind of person to stay around. Mm. And if, if you're that kind of person, you take the harsh comments uh, the right way. Mm. I think a lot of people who have publicly and loudly left the Bitcoin space, <laughs> I think a lot of them have not been able to stay, to you know put up with the, the straightforwardness in mm. a sense. Like people get this like, they get this false sense of pride, I guess, like, you know, because it's, it's something to be proud of, I think. To be a part of Bitcoin Core is something to be proud of. But you, if you get this pride and it becomes too much, if you become too proud, then you start, you know, I guess you start taking personal offense at, at people saying your ideas suck, which, mm. you know, a lot of people are saying a lot of ideas suck. And that's just mm. the way it goes. Like like I said, like a lot of ideas are go unmerged, you know, mm. and we don't see a those. Ton of them. <laughs> yeah, there's so many. Yeah. <laughs> oh 
And like the default answer is no. And it kind of should be because it's, you know, like almost like a trillion dollar network or whatever. And, you know, but there are a lot of kind of fragile egos that have gone away. So tell me more about like the kinds of people that stay. Because in a sense, like there's a lot of benefit to staying around and going through these processes and stuff. But there's also like a lot of drama, right? Like there's, you know you know, fights that go on. And, you know, I mean, the whole taproot activation thing was just such a headache. Like, tell us more about maybe some of the, you know, like things that you find maybe a little bit tiring. Well, to be honest, like the, the, in Bitcoin Core, like, even if your idea is really good, it can take a long time and effort to find someone to look at it and to give Mm -hmm. you feedback. And if no one's looking at it, it's not going to be merged, right? So it's not mm-hmm. purely a matter of enduring all the all the review. You also have to kind of actively yourself find reviewers. And that mm-hmm. to me was really hard because I really don't like bugging people. And essentially, if you're writing code and you put up a pull request and you don't say anything and wait months and months, it's just going to it's gonna lie there. Like no one's going to go and randomly open your pull request. And in Bitcoin Core, it's become, there's so many pull requests that you can't just go in order. I've tried this once. I've tried going in order <laughs> from the oldest to newest and trying to review them. And the first thing I realized is that I don't even know if this is an idea anymore because it's so old. Mm-hmm. Like there's pull requests mm-hmm. that are from like 2016 or something. Mm-hmm. And they're just lying there. Like I think Luke has, has the oldest one right now. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so you look at them and you're like, I don't even know if this is, this is an idea. And I skip over the ones that have not been rebased and that mm-hmm. have like a, a, a you know a cross on the on the unit uh, test passing. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, the continuous integration stuff. And so, so I find the ones that are ready to be merged, and then I try to review them, and then I realize often that I have no idea what this code does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like so. There are so many aspects of it that you know. Some of them, you don't know all of it. And, and, you know, so you can only review certain parts. So finding someone to look at your code, you know, well, essentially, it's impossible to go from oldest to newest. So what people do is they, they sort by recently updated. Mm-hmm. And then they go through and review that. So that's nice if you have updates. But if you mm-hmm. made a pull request, okay, I'm done now. And then you, you wait for someone to review it. It's going to gradually fall off that list. because <laughs> Everyone else is updating their pull request. So... So you have this big problem. And I know a lot of people have been trying to find ways to solve this issue, but there's so far I haven't seen anything. And there have been some like, you know, really active reviewers like Jonathan and other people who have been like really actively reviewing and giving a fresh kind of like, you know, fresh, a bit of fresh air to the situation. But it's, it's still like, you, you still have to kind of, kind of work around that. So that's a tiring part of it, I think. It's mm, because mm. it's a rigorous... And because there's so many proposals compared to the people who are reviewing, you kind of get a big backlog and it's hard to prioritize. (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine. And there's just so many different moving parts and you're constantly having to rebase. And like Signet for you took like a year, right? Like, and you had to rebase every time, like there was like a new request merged and stuff. What was that? More than a year. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it was a long time. Yeah. But tell um, us more about that process and what that was like, because I can't imagine. Well, I do have a pull request on like BTCD that's been open for like six years, but well, <laughs> yeah, like, like I know they're not never going to merge it because it, it's just like too many. Like basically, the original devs like left the project. I think Lalu's <laughs> in charge now, so it's it's never getting merged. Right. But you know, like for you, like that was like I still think Signet's awesome, right? Like you have this network that's, you know, like making blocks on a regular basis and it's predictable. And if you want something less predictable, you can always go to Testnet. But you right. have Signet, and you know, like it's really cool, great idea. But it took you like over a year to get merged in. What yeah. was that like and why did it take so long? So uh, the harsh, sad truth is that it took so long because I suck at nudging people, I think. <laughs> but also it's it's a new network and you know it adds stuff to the consensus layer, even though that's mm-hmm. a flag that's off in Bitcoin. It's still, you know, it's a consensus layer. So so people are really careful about that. And, Mm. But I think the contrasting thing about Signet is that 
everyone wanted it. Like when we had personal meetups, the core developers would all sit down and I would ask like, so do you guys want Signet? And everyone would be like, yeah, hell yeah, we want Signet. Um, and then I'd go home and I'm like, okay, guys, <laughs> you want Signet? Please review. And then the one would review. So, so it was like, it was, it was a demand versus the time that people gave to it. It was very contrasting and, and confusing. But ultimately, it was my fault. Like I could have just poked people to look at it more and be more incessant about it. That basically sums it up. Like, honestly, that's, that's most of the time, whenever I have pull requests, they take a year because I just don't like poking people. Um, <laughs> so, Well, I mean, I think, you know, I was talking to Steve Lee a while back about it. Yeah. I, I, this seems to be like a problem for a lot of developers. Yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, this is what like, people like me are there to do at, in core development is just nudge people because, you know, they're literally project managers. They know how to... You know, they know what needs to get done next and they go and prod the people at the right time and so right. on. It seems like that's a little bit missing in the core development process a little bit. Yeah, it, the thing is like in Bitcoin Core, you know, you don't have like a project plan or, or uh -huh. like, like deadlines or, you know, things like that. Everyone just does whatever they want to work on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have people like me who's working at a company and getting paid by the company mm -hmm. to do stuff in Bitcoin. But I think that's rare. I think the, most mm -hmm. of the time it's people who are doing it on their free time or they're getting paid to work on Bitcoin, but they're not giving it, you know. There's no direction not, given. Yeah, there's yeah. no direction on purpose because, you know, mm -hmm. they don't want to tie people into working on something that, that could potentially be, you know, unneeded or unwanted. So I think it's people do what they want to do. So having a manager to poke people would still be like, yeah, but I'm busy with something else now. <laughs> And I don't know, I mean, it's like, ultimately, you kind of have to take responsibility for your own stuff. I think the lesson I need to learn and the lesson people need to learn in general, and the thing we need to kind of educate people about is that you have to kind of, when you make a proposal, like a pull request, just making a pull request, it's just the first part, right? Mm. You have to then figure out like who, like if you look at the git blame, you can see who changed mm. the code that you're changing. Mm -hmm. And you can go to them and you can say, hey, I did some updates to the code you've done. Would you mind looking at it? And you link them to the pull request. And most of the time, people will be happy to look at how you screwed with their code, you know? <laughs> and also, like, I, I've myself on Twitter said, you know, if you have a pull request and you're frustrated and not finding your viewers, just send me a DM. Like, my DMs are open mm -hmm. on Twitter always. Like, I get random messages from Nigeria all the time. <laughs> just DM me, say, hey, I have a pull request here. Would you mind looking at it? And, I can't guarantee that I will understand it, but mm. if I do understand it, I will look at it and I will give you comments, you know? Mm. And that's kind of, you know, you have to kind of stack up the reviews. And if you have enough reviews that the maintainers feel confident, then, you know, the next step is just to po poke someone until they merge it. Mm. But, right. but yeah, I think the lesson I need to learn Oh, well, needed to learn was that you just opening the pull request is not it's not going to make people rush to your pull request and review it because reviewers there are fewer reviewers than there are proposers. Yeah, which you know, like, is something that I think everyone that's been in this process like recognizes. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's way more people that want to write code than want to review code. Yet yeah. the reviewing is like actually way more important, and you need a lot more of it in volume. Yeah. So, ah, uh, man, such a an interesting incentive system overall that, yeah. uh, that that's developed around it. I think people are even like exchanging reviews with each other. It's like, I'll review your code if you review mine. <laughs> I've definitely done that. I'm guilty. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, let's think about like contrast sort of like core development to mm -hmm. general development or like other development jobs that you've had. Like, what strikes you as, like, very different? I mean, we've talked about some of them, but, you know, I mean, do you see the results being different? Do you see the goals being different? What strikes you as the most different between sort of, like, the traditional development process and what's going on in core? I haven't really done any, like, other open source stuff, really. Well, not uh, even open source, but, like, at a company or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, what I mean is, like, I don't know if it's Bitcoin Core in particular, or if it's open source development in particular. Mm. So I, I, I can be a bit vague there, but like you know, the fact that you don't have a, a plan, mm. a collective plan, makes mm. it 
it's an interesting dynamic where you have you know development going in different directions and people are working on different things sometimes conflicting things for example the soon to be probably infamous BIP322, <laughs> the, the sign message upgrade that I've been proposing mm-hmm. and and it's been going through many iterations. Like I was, I wrote code for it a while back and then the wallet code in Bitcoin Core has just completely changed. Mm. And I was like, I don't even know how to rewrite this code <laughs> to, to <laughs> work with the new code. Like, mm. And I basically just closed the pull request and, and figured I'd come back to it when the wallet changes are done. And just redo mm. it. So I guess one part of different from working at a company is, you know, you have a Bitcoin core is kind of like a living organism. It doesn't always go in the direction you want it to, even though it's probably a good direction it's going in. Mm. So you have this dynamic where, you know, it can be anti-productive to you, where even though it's mm-hmm. productive to the uh, Bitcoin core uh, code base itself. So, so that, yeah, that's it one thing. So. That, yeah. That, it sounds almost like decentralization or something like yeah, it's a, right. yeah, yeah, yeah it's, everyone's like kind of doing their own thing but there's like order that emerges sort of naturally and it might not be the order that you were thinking yeah right yeah a lot of people like you know, it's interesting because people point at bitcoin core and say these guys are controlling bitcoin <laughs> and i'm like who do you mean exactly when you say these guys because i sure as hell does not i do not control bitcoin let me tell you that mm. much like, mm-hmm. like, so if I'm a Bitcoin Core developer, I've been, you know, a Bitcoin Core developer for a while now. If I'm not controlling Bitcoin, so who are you talking about? Are you talking about the maintainers? Mm-hmm. Like, if a maintainer went in and merged something that the people were not, you know, thoroughly mm-hmm. happy about, then people would be like, you know, whining and yelling and <laughs> being, being all up in, in their, you know, like people are really, you know, they take this seriously, right? Mm-hmm. And they're waiting for something like that to happen so they can, you know, yell and point fingers. Like, especially the people who don't like Bitcoin Core mm. are probably just waiting for an opportunity to point something out like that. But because it's not happening and it's never going to happen, you know, they're just going to sit there and wait, yes. essentially. What I mean is mm. Bitcoin Core does not control Bitcoin because nobody controls Bitcoin Core. Mm. Right? Yeah. So even though Bitcoin Core tends to set the standard for what Bitcoin does, none of the individual developers in Bitcoin Core has any say really in, you know, the direction it's taking. People propose stuff and then people shoot it down, you know. Mm. And that happens all the time. Yeah, (laughs) right. Even with the most federal core developers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I will never forget when I was in San Francisco and I was talking to Peter Willey and he started talking about this idea he had. And... I was like completely new to Bitcoin. Mm. And I said, well, wait, doesn't that, you know, go against the idea that the payee, you know, pays the t- transaction fees? Like in, mm-hmm. you know, when you, when you make an address, the address is mm-hmm. encoded so that no matter how complex your address is, the sender doesn't have to pay for your complexity, right? In your mm-hmm. address. And he looked at me, he's like, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> and then he just you know dropped it and that to me was like i was like wait did i just wait did i just what something (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah that kind of stuck with me like if a newbie can come up to peter willie and shoot down his idea like that peter willie being the guy who invents taproot and and most of segwit and you know the modern bitcoin is Mm -hmm. basically mostly his ideas Mm -hmm. then you know Bitcoin is not controlled by anybody because if a random person can just point out an issue and, and then everyone respects that, then as long as there are no issues, like what's the problem, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, and you know, he's had a lot of different ideas. Like I don't think a lot of people know just like how many ideas he has and like you know, you go to these like, you know, the core dev meetings that uh, you and I have been to. Yeah. And you find like he he'll discuss something. And it's like, what? Yeah, this is BIP one fifty or something like that. It's right. Like, I didn't even know about this. And yeah. you know, and they're going into like, you know, like we can make the encryption secure. So here's the protocol that I'm thinking. And it's like, uh, you know, somebody will point out some flaw in it. And it's like, okay, and then we might need to change that to this or whatever. And it's like, 
wow, this is like such a fringe part of yeah. Bitcoin, but he's like put so much thought into it. Yeah, um, I know. Like, I remember Tad Dreja, uh, who uh-huh. was part of the Lightning Network. Yeah, he guys. wrote the original yeah, Lightning yeah. paper. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, I was talking to him and he was saying, like, yeah, I'm kind of waiting for Peter Woolley to finish his optimizations on the, ba- on the batch 32 stuff. Uh huh. We're just waiting for it to finish. We can start using it. <laughs> like, he's, he's all like optimizing and optimizing, and everyone's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Just you know, mm. whenever you're done, just hand it over. You know, like like everyone mm. was more, you know, they just wanted to use it. And Peter was like, "Wait, no, no, no. We have to be perfect." Of but, course, like, he updated it again, but yeah, right, you know. yeah. Then he updated it. <laughs> but to touch on what you were saying, like a lot of people probably f- don't know about it or forgot about it, but th- there's an entirely different proposal from Taproot by, by Mark Friedenbach to do uh, Merkle, Merkle trees. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, mm-hmm. um, Mer- what was it called? Mast. Uh, Merkleized mm-hmm. abstract syntax trees. Mm-hmm. And uh, the proposal, I was kind of asked to push it mm-hmm. forward. And it was a proposal that was, it was, it was very thorough and very, you know, thought out. And it could, mm-hmm. it could potentially do a lot of really cool things. And that proposal, I, I personally, I think Mark disagrees with me, but I think that proposal is now completely obsolete by Taproot. Which yeah, because well, because you have a tap script, <laughs> right? Which is also essentially that's a mast. Yeah, yeah, it, it is mast. It, it is exactly mm-hmm. mast. And so, but but if you look at Taproot, you also realize that Taproot is like ten different proposals yeah. uh, that have been yeah. iterated and discarded and reiterated, and like there was something called a graft root. There was something mm-hmm. called Groot. Or I think Groot mm-hmm. and Graft are the same. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. there was a lot of proposals going back and forth. A bunch of people were just, you know, iterating and iterating on this basic idea that Greg Maxwell threw on the mailing list. Like, mm-hmm. And, you know, so Taproot, people say Taproot, but what they're really saying is this big bundle of things. <laughs> you know, Snore and yeah. uh, <laughs> Taproot right. and Mast and, yeah, uh, yeah. so many yeah. things. Yeah, and a lot of them were discarded or reiterated or, you know, replaced. And so you only see the stuff that goes in, but you don't realize that there's a lot of stuff that doesn't go in. Um, mm-hmm. Like, I mean, recently that's been going, you know, going around is, is the, the drive chain stuff, the BP300 mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, that's also like the author is insisting on there being favoritism or something, I think. But in mm-hmm. reality, it's just what I mentioned earlier, like the whole people are harsh. Mm-hmm. And you know, straightforward, and they can be straight, you know, straight out rude mm-hmm. sometimes because they just want to cut to the core and they don't compromise. You know, mm-hmm. so it's like, yeah, well, this guy's nice, so let's compromise and put this thing in that's going to compromise <laughs> the entire security of a several billion trillion dollar network. You know, I mean, that's, uh-huh. you know, you don't do that. So I think you know, you have to have the mindset of openness and humility, and try to advocate for your stuff. Uh, yeah. and, and be willing to change it right like and th- yeah. this is uh what you're bringing up about taproot it went through many iterations with a lot of review yep. i mean like i remember seeing like the pub key for schnorr signatures like using like i think it was going to be odd versus e- or no it was going to be like the squ- one that is a square root and one isn't yeah. instead they changed it to odd even you know, like stuff like that. Like it went right. through so many iterations before it actually got in. You know, I'm not seeing anything like that with BIP 300 with drive chains or something. I mean, it's, right. it's an interesting idea, but there's there's no real iteration or review or hey, this might be a problem, this might be a problem, right. and you know, like the author addressing it. That doesn't seem to be happening there. Yeah, I mean, from what I understand, like I think he's working on on the proposal still, uh, and mm-hmm. he's he's just like I'm just gonna keep working on it. And I respect that. Mm-hmm. I can see that. What I don't think is okay is is the you know attacks on the core devs and, and stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's necessary. I think that's that's a mistake. You don't have to do that because you know the core devs are not a group of people in the first place. Like they're scattered all over the world. They have different views. You know, they're libertarians, liberals, socialists, communists. Everything mm-hmm. is just ma- mixed in there. And everyone has conflicting views. I mean, we probably all hate each other if we met in person and started talking about <laughs> stuff outside of Bitcoin. But because we are all into Bitcoin, we just kind of like hanging with each other because, you know. So you kind of have to do, you know, understand that part. And I think that's a hard thing to understand, apparently. Like, people are concerned about about that. So, but... Um, well, I mean, they're kind of used to, like, 
a development process that's very different it seems yeah to me. like they're used to sort of like what you were describing where you have a plan and you have a roadmap and right you know you have a project manager and you have deadlines and all that i mean this is how all coins are developed it seems like right but there's a, you know there's a marketing is, team and you know <laughs> yeah. the ethereum foundation wait no never mind <laughs> <laughs> and you have to get in this feature because it's part yeah. of our narrative or something like that instead it, it's just sort of like this very free-flowing decentralized process where right you know, I, like, sorry, you just didn't get the things that were required to get there. And if you're not willing to, you know, like, you know, fix these issues that we found, then sorry, it's not, it's just not getting in. Yeah. That's very hard for a lot of people. And like you were saying, it's, it requires a certain type of person. Yeah. Well, I think it, even worse, even harder to deal with is the, Greg Maxwell describes it as the thunderous silence. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is, People don't agree with your proposal, but they're not mm -hmm. ready to fight about it. Mm. <laughs> um, so they just ignore it, right? They don't respond, they don't react. And so when you propose something and then there's like silence, mm. and then you don't know if that means that people don't agree with it or if it means that people don't care or if it means that, you know, it's hard to gauge what what the sentiment is when you have that. Thunder kind of silence. Situation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. So I think that that's also a big issue. And I think that may be one of the drive chain things. I'm not sure because I wasn't really paying attention to when that was discussed the first place and uh, the first time. Mm. I mean. But I mean, yeah, like being ignored can also make you kind of like bummed <laughs> out as well. Yeah, you know? it's a very discouraging endeavor. Yeah. In some ways, yeah. I mean, despite the people being very nice and everything else, it's right. like, okay, like no one seems at all interested. It just might be that your idea kind of sucks. Right. And, yeah. Like people don't yeah. want to tell you that it sucks. Yeah. And also the thing that is unique about Bitcoin, I think, mm -hmm. is that every single person, when they get into Bitcoin, mm. they're like, I'm new to Bitcoin. I know how to solve this. <laughs> and then they come with a solution to increase the block size or to like... Uh, increase to, to, you know, make blocks go faster or, or something mm. like that. And they propose mm. it and then they send out this email to the mailing list. Like, hey, Bitcoin, 2 million transactions per second. And then you're like, oh, not again. And people <laughs> have been going through this for years and years. And so it, some people are like, this, even today they respond and gently describe why it's a bad idea. And or people come in to say, like, proof of work is really bad for the environment. Let's change it and, and make it, mm -hmm. you know, let's just use this other thing, which is proof of work with, you know, mm -hmm. with lipstick on it. And, <laughs> and someone just says, well, if you do that, you're going to, you know, ultimately get down to, be, to proof of work anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think a big issue that is unique to Bitcoin probably is the fact that everyone who's new knows exactly how to solve it. <laughs> and they all go in and, and they go through these steps, right? Like ex exactly like Elon Musk went through these steps mm -hmm. and he did it publicly mm -hmm. on, on Twitter. He went through the steps too. And just like everyone else did, you know, everyone goes through those steps. Like I, I haven't seen, and maybe there are some people who are like exceptions, uh -huh. but generally like, at least I did. Well, I mean, these are people that are, I guess, confident enough to try to put in a pull request to core or at least email the mailing list. I suspect that the people that aren't are the ones that are humble enough to recognize, okay, I, I really can't fix Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, this is probably something someone's already thought of or something to that effect. Yeah, right. But it is interesting how many of those <laughs> happen, yeah. like that think that they know. Right. Yeah. It's it's like the mailing list is like you see this email coming back over and over again with different author names. Ah, <laughs> uh, man. So let's try to sort of like wrap this up and talk a little bit more about the future. Uh, do you see this development process that Core has done? Like, do you see it going anywhere? else or like being applied elsewhere or is it just very unique to core i think that the more i i'm gonna wrap it a little here when i realized bitcoin was basically it and that's kind of like the harsh reality i started becoming interested in finding out why people care about other things and to me it was very interesting when i was talking to Tad Straja about lightning mm -hmm. uh, the, the way he explained it to me was that he was talking to Ethereum people saying, why aren't you using Bitcoin? What can't you do in Bitcoin that you can do in Ethereum? And they said, you can't do this channel thing. Mm -hmm. you know? I think it was a channel thing. It may have been something more abstract, but 
Mm-hmm. And he's like, wait, you can't? And then he went back home and he started thinking about it. And he realized, wait, 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 if you do it like this, you know. And mm-hmm. so basically, I don't know which Joseph Poon and he mm-hmm. co-authored it. So I don't know who came up with what part. But basically, by talking to the Ethereum people, they came up with Lightning, you know, in a way, mm-hmm. in a sense. And I was like, well, that's cool. I'll talk to the Ethereum people too and, and see if there's something else that we can can't do. Maybe I can figure that out. And mm-hmm. ultimately, people who are really involved in, in Ethereum, the thing they told me was that there's nothing technically in <laughs> Ethereum that you can't do in Bitcoin. It's just a matter of a different uh, community. Uh-huh. And the Ethereum people love to play around and try things and experiment. Bitcoin people, they're like, they want hard money. Mm. They don't want to play around and experiment. Mm. They don't want to play and, and risk losing their money and, and do things like that. So there's a big like difference in, in what you want. Like People who are, are into Bitcoin and really into it, they are looking at it as a solution to an actual real problem. Whereas Ethereum people are looking at Ethereum as, as, as a new thing to like, new things, I don't know. Um, but also there's no, <laughs> and like my pinned tweet on Twitter is like, tell me something that makes sense that you cannot do in Bitcoin. And it has responses from people, things I agree with, like covenants Mm -hmm. are something that would be really cool in Bitcoin. But there's nothing that's, you know, like Ethereum-ish that that you cannot do in Bitcoin for technological reasons, right? So ultimately, what we come back to is that Bitcoin is Bitcoin. And Mm. there's never, ever going to be anything like it, Mm. I think. So... Mm -hmm. Do I think that it's going to spread and become a thing in other products? No, I don't think so. I think that Bitcoin and the development process in Bitcoin Core is very unique and very specific to Bitcoin. And it, it's explicitly kind of tuned to the needs of Bitcoin. So, I mean, I can see things like kernel developers, you know, being rigorous and stuff. But they're not working against a kernel that is running, that is online and has to stay online mm. 24-7, right? If you do an oops in Bitcoin and manage to screw it up somehow, you're stuck with that, you mm. know? So the kind of like the underlying conditions are unique to Bitcoin, which is making the developer process and the, and the, you know, the developer atmosphere and how people are interacting with each other, the, the what do you call it, the culture. Something that is very specific, I think, to Bitcoin. Yeah, it's almost like Bitcoin selects for sort of like a decentralized development process. If you try to get things in through like force of personality or whatever, which is yeah. in a sense very centralized, like it doesn't work on Bitcoin. <laughs> it like might work in a company or it might work in maybe even other open source projects or whatever, but it does yeah. not work in Bitcoin at right. all. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you've seen that in history, like with really, really like revered Bitcoin core developers mm-hmm. who decided that, you know, that they make the decisions and realizing harshly and brutally that, that that's not the case. You know, you see mm-hmm. examples of that, you know, G- G- Gavin and Reason and, and mm-hmm. my turn. Um, yeah. And honestly, like, I think if someone like Greg Maxwell or Peter Willey would suddenly start doing that then then people will say like no yeah uh, even though those two people are super humble and mm. i can't imagine that they would ever <laughs> i do don't think like they that, would no, yeah i mean and i think that's part of why they're around for so long because they have this mm. humble part of them this hunger for understanding for learning new things which mm. completely supersedes everything else like the hunger for knowledge is higher than their the need for pride and you know acknowledgement Mm. So they'd rather be wrong and, and learn something than be right and not, you know? Mm. Mm. Wow, that's awesome. And I think the listeners will really like this episode. So just to wrap up, where can people find you? So I'm on Twitter at uh, Kalowulf, K-A-L-L-E-W-O-O-F. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably the best place to find me. <laughs> All right, good stuff, man. Thanks for being on. Yeah, it was my pleasure.
Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this podcast. I joined Unchained as an advisor on the engineering side, and I know the team. I know what they're building, and I am very excited. If you need multi-sig collaborative custody or a Bitcoin native financial services partner, learn more at Unchained.com. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Bitcoin Fixes This. Carl Johan Alm, or Cowie, can be found at Cowie Wolf on Twitter. Until next time, fiat, the one best.